So had she not connected the fact that this is what she talks about with the fact that she had no friends? No, that's the big disconnect. When kids have social learning challenges, that's the disconnect. So I teach about the concept of reputation, which I've never seen another social skills program that talks about that. Your reputation is what other people think about you. And it comes from the things that you say and the things that you do. This is the very first lesson in my program. It is free on my website. It's the foundation of everything. My students either have never heard of the concept of reputation and have no awareness of it, or they can tell you about other people's reputations, but have no concept of their reputation. Or the next level is they are very aware that other kids think they are annoying, but they have no idea why. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast. ADHD for smart ass women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 224 of ADHD for Smart Ass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyotsuka.com. My purpose is always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. And in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I've never met a one that wasn't truly brilliant at something not one. So for this reason, I am just delighted to introduce you to Steph West. Steph West is the creator and director of Starfish Social Club that teaches neurodivergent kids and teens how to make friends without masking or conforming. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and master's degrees in special education and education administration, as well as specialist certifications in behavior, autism, traumatic brain injury, inclusion, and transition. All her formal education means little compared to the experience and education she has gained learning from her students over the last almost 20 years. She's been published in Forbes and recently started a second business teaching others how to start and run a social club like hers in their own community. Steph was formally diagnosed with ADHD in 2021, which has made her even more committed to her students and helps them relate to her on a very personal level. Some of her favorite things about herself are her impulsivity and her insatiable appetite for novelty. She runs two businesses. She is learning to speak Dutch after falling in love very briefly with a man from the Netherlands. She is working towards getting her private pilot's license. She has completed one Ironman triathlon and six half Ironman triathlons, including two races in the last month in two countries, 
on the other side of the world. Steph is on a mission to change the way we teach social skills, as well as the way we raise our neurodivergent kids in general. She's spearheading that change one student at a time through her social groups, licensing program, and business coaching. When Steph isn't with her students or engaged in one of her many hobbies, you can find her either outside in nature or curled up with her kitty reading a good book. Nonfiction, of course. Steph, did I get all of that right? That is, I think that's about it. That is me in a big nutshell. (laughs) Yeah. And when I read all that, are you like, wow, I did all that? I, you know, it is interesting when somebody asks me to give a bio or, or my background or talk about myself. It, it is really interesting. I think it's easy for us to lose sight of things that we've accomplished and achieved and just the cool people that we are. I think it's easy to, for that to get lost. Yeah, absolutely. So before we talk about your starfish social club and all of the things that you've done around neurodivergence. Can we talk about your diagnoses first? Yeah, absolutely. It's such an interesting journey because of what I do. I've I've been working with students in the special education realm since 2004. I started out as a teacher for kids whose behavior prevented them from being in the regular classroom in the school system and did that for a few years. And then I became a behavior specialist for a school district. And And what is a behavior specialist? It is basically the firefighter. It is the person that gets the call when kids are eloping, aggressing, refusing to work, anything and everything that may be interfering with basically the education of other students. Mm. So, so it's I not work, about them. It's about the other students. It's it, You tend to get the calls for the kids who are the most disruptive. Of course. And, and that's really what I, what I noticed about that job is that there were so many kids that I would see in classrooms, in the cafeteria, on the playground, in PE that didn't have friends that were struggling that, you know, had social challenges, but they weren't disruptive. And it's actually kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but that's what caused me to start my program is because my focus as a behavior specialist was putting out all the fires. And it was such a small population of of the kids that I actually got to support and got to work with out of, you know, the huge population of kids that, that really needed support and needed that environment. But because they weren't standing out, they weren't disruptive. They weren't running away. They weren't hurting anybody. I called them floaters. They just Ah. went throughout their day, not having social interactions, not having, you know, friends, but, they weren't bothering anybody in the process. So during when I had that position, I was a, a trainer for all the staff in my district. And I remember I was asked to do a presentation on ADHD. <laughs> and I had at the time a very stereotypical idea of what that meant. So this was probably 2008. I started doing research into ADHD and really latched on to the gifted portion of it and learned so much about the challenges that kids have when they're diagnosed with ADHD and they're gifted, twice exceptional, right? Because of the the dichotomy between their, their awareness of how intelligent they are, how talented they are but also their awareness of the fact that they're getting in trouble or they might not be passing or they struggle to get along with other kids or nobody likes them. And that stuck out to me so much because I understood that. And that really started my my journey into learning more about ADHD and learning all of that was the first time it had ever occurred to me that I may have ADHD 
just reading all of the information about it. However, at the time, I got really hung up on the fact that I did really well in school, my entire school history. I only got in trouble in school one time in my life, um, and that was for pushing a boy down on the playground in third grade. Um, and it, it was so traumatic that I remember it, right? It was the only time I ever got in trouble in school. I School was easy for me. School was enjoyable for me because I love learning. I, you know, I have a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees. So I was in school forever and it was not difficult for me. So in 2008, I really got hung up on the fact that I felt like I related to so much about ADHD, except that I didn't struggle in school. And I remember I even took home an an assessment, a checklist to my husband at the time. And I was reading things to him because, you know, it's, it's hard to assess yourself. It's, it's hard to see yourself the way that other people see you. And so I wanted someone else's opinion. And so I was going through the checklist with him. And on a lot of things, we had the same thoughts. But I remember I read off one that said something about, do other people see you as messy or something about that? I just remember the word messy. And in my opinion, I am not messy. I am cluttered. I am disorganized. But to me, messy is... um, you know, food containers and the trash not being taken out and, and bugs and, and, you know, that kind of thing. And my husband, when I read that to him said, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it hurt my feelings. It shocked me. I might've even started crying because I've never considered myself to be messy, but to know that the person I lived with did feel that way really caught me off guard. So fast forward, I went the rest of forever, not really knowing what was going on with me, just knowing I had executive functioning challenges. I have sensory sensitivities. And then I started my own business. At the time, I was still working full-time in the school system. That went okay. It was really when I transitioned to only running the business and not doing anything else that I just could not function as a business owner. I couldn't get stuff done. I couldn't plan my time. I couldn't prioritize. I I never really knew what I should be doing. It's like I would wake up every day and I had just landed on this earth. It was like there was no carryover from one day to the next. So that's when, that was in 2021, that's when I pursued a formal diagnosis And in the process, the questions that were asked were things I'd never even known were characteristics of ADHD. And so it it validated even more that this is how my brain is wired. So that's been almost two years since since I received that diagnosis. So my um, long story. No, it actually wasn't. <laughs> um, so it was great. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, now, you said that there were certain things that you didn't even know were part of ADHD. And once you discovered they were, you were like, oh, my gosh, this must be me. Do you remember what any of them were? I knew you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I, no, I um my, I have a very poor memory, so I'll just throw that out there. I do remember that one of them, I think just the way that the question was phrased was a little bit, it made me think about the concept a little bit differently. Um, it had to do, basically it had to do with um, special interests, perseverations, that kind of thing. And I had never really thought about that before, but when I get interested in something, I am all or nothing. And I have realized that I live my life that way. Everything about my life, I'm either all in or I don't care about it at all. That I'm not an in-between kind of person. And so it helped me realize that 
when I was actively dating, I would fixate on men. When I have a hobby, I fixate on that hobby. When there's something that I want to research, I will fixate, I will spend hours or days learning about one thing that I saw on a TV show or that I was mentioned in a book I was reading. And it's, it's always changing. There's, there's always different things that I'm, I'm really interested in, but when I'm interested in it, I'm all in. And so that was interesting. I hadn't really thought of that about myself before until I saw that question on the assessment. And I remember it was a written assessment. I did an online um, evaluation and I wrote so much in response to that question because I just kept thinking of all of the things that I had gone so overboard on. And it's, you know, if you, you know, if you look in our Facebook group, it's people talking about the hobbies they pick up and they buy all the stuff (laughs) and then they're over it. Um, I don't tend to get over things that quickly. I tend to hold on to them. So I don't jump around as much as I notice other people do, but definitely just that going all in concept. I had never really realized that about myself before. So what were you like as a child? Clearly school was a breeze for you. And so you saw yourself as smart and everybody else saw you as smart as well. Does that make sense? I think it does. Yes. Um, You know how you can't hear things sometimes? (laughs) Or or you'll be like that. How do I spell that? Oh my gosh. How can I not remember how to spell that? Yeah. Uh, The synapses, right? So I'm just curious what were the things that uh, were definitely ADHD traits that you had as a child that obviously weren't around school? Yeah. So I was a very different person between school and home. I have very, very few memories of my life before I was about 14. So most of what I know is from stories that have been told to me. The most common story of my childhood, well, the not necessary, not singular story, but um, apparently when I was four, I have an older brother. And when I was four, my mom went back to work. So she had stopped working when my brother was born to stay home. And then I was born two years later. So when he went to first grade, she went back to work and I went to daycare. And according to my family, I, the year I was four, I lost my damn mind. Um, I was having meltdowns all the time. I was physically aggressive. Um, I was screaming and hollering and biting and hitting and kicking. The only things, clearly I don't remember, the things that I've been told that were triggers for me was anytime I had to put shoes on. Um, which I still don't like wearing shoes. Um, Anytime I had to go somewhere I didn't want to go, which was pretty much everywhere. Um, I don't think it was things like not getting my way. I don't think that was really an issue for me. I think it was sensory stuff is what it really sounds like. And so my parents went to the pediatrician who told them to... I I can't tell if I have an actual memory of this or if I have a contrived memory based on what I've been told, but the memory I have in my brain is that my dad would put me inside a sleeping bag up to my neck and then hold me off of the ground in my room with the light off and the fan off so that basically I would just wear myself out and kind of pass out slash fall asleep. And that's what the pediatrician told them to do because I was so aggressive. When I think about that, again, I don't even think it's a real memory. I think it's contrived based on what I've been told. It makes me cry when when I think about that. And it also, it makes me very, very sad for four-year-old Steph that nobody recognized the significance of that kind of behavior. Yeah. And it's interesting that it started when your mom left to go to work, right? Yeah. And, and 
I never had a really close relationship with my mom. So it's hard for me to believe that I did at four. Mm. Um, but I, you know, it could be just general abandonment, general anxiety. You know, I, yeah. I don't, I don't really know. So then the next year I started going to school and everything switched. I loved school. I was totally fine. Everything was good. The only thing I really have memories about from my childhood, they're not even events or situations, they're feelings. I remember feeling like I was always in trouble at home, but I don't even know why. Um, I remember this was before people had cell phones. So I remember I had a landline phone that had, I had my own phone number and constantly I was getting my phone taken away, but I knew where my parents hit it. So I would just go get it and plug it back in. Like I was a very defiant child. I remember getting hit and spanked frequently and I remember one time yelling at my mom because I didn't even understand why that was happening. Um, I remember one time being in the van and she turned around and, and smacked me and I smacked her back um, and told her to not ever hit me again. <laughs> Did it um, work? Yes. I had one parent who was very calm and collected and chill and one parent who was very extreme when I would do whatever it was that I was doing. And so I remember that dichotomy as well. I remember one parent yelling and screaming and one parent saying, you know, go upstairs, go upstairs, I'll handle this. Um, but I don't even remember the things that I was doing to cause that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you don't really know, okay, how much of this was frankly trauma, right? And yeah. how much of it was um, ADHD in terms yeah. of, you know, the oppositional component of it. I mean, you were a little kid who was basically sticking up for yourself because you knew that this was not the way you treat a four-year-old or, you know, eight-year-old or 10-year-old or any child. So I'm wondering, did your brother have the same relationship or was he much more compliant? Um, my brother, the whole time we were growing up was the ideal child. Um, and so there was definitely um, comparison between us from that standpoint. You know, he was always the ideal child. Uh, we had a really strict household. And so the night that my brother went to college, he ended up in the emergency room with alcohol poisoning. Um, because we weren't allowed to go out, drink, you know, it just, you know, everybody has their own guidelines for their kids. Um, but I think ours were so strict that we swung the other way whenever we had sure. the opportunity. So yeah, his first night in college, he ended up with alcohol poisoning. I was going out, I was sneaking out in high school. Um, my parents, I don't think they still know that that was a thing. Um, but I would sneak out of my bedroom in high school and I had a friend that was kind of allowed to do whatever she wanted. And so once I got a driver's license, the story was that I, that Sarah was drunk at a party and I needed to go pick her up when really I was just going to the party. So, I mean, I started, I was smoking pot. I was, um, there was a, a guy that lived across the street from me that was a year older than me. We were hanging out all the time. He eventually dropped out of school. But yeah, I mean, I was smoking cigarettes. I was smoking pot. I was drinking. I was sneaking out. Uh, when I was in high school, I remember I started having mental health challenges that were never addressed. I remember the perception of me at home was that I was being like basically a bratty teenager when really I was having some serious mental health challenges I became suicidal. Oh, um, I don't think my parents even know that now. So that it's kind of like 14 year old me was four year old me just in a bigger, more mature body. So high school was really challenging, but not in school. Again, in, in school, I, I was awesome. Um, I think school was very stimulating for me mentally. And um, safe. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I was a smart kid. I was, I grew up in a really small town. So, I mean, everybody knows everybody. I was popular. I was, you know, well-liked. I was friendly. I was smart. So yeah, I mean, school was definitely my element. And because it wasn't difficult for me, I didn't really have to study. I didn't, you know, the things that trip up other people, I, I yeah. didn't really have to do those things. And it also sounds like school was pretty much your salvation, right? It was where you felt yeah. good and respected and valued. And it sounds like at home, it was one of those home environments where kids should be seen and not heard. And they weren't really like what you thought didn't even matter. I, I think my my impression of my childhood, obviously now, you know, 40, I'm 40, almost 42 now. So all these years later is I think one of my parents really wanted the ideal family. And we were until I was four years old. Um, And then we weren't anymore. And I think there was always this desire for me to get my shit together so that we could be the ideal family. Again, we were in a small town. My parents were both teachers. um, So very well known. Uh, you know, in our church, very well known. And most people, I think, didn't know the other side of me. Um, I, you know, most people saw me as being really smart and friendly and whatever until I got to high school. And then I think my reputation changed a bit. But that's kind of my impression of my childhood. I, it's the whole square peg, round hole situation. I, that's how I feel about my childhood is I was always expected to fit into the round hole. And I'm not capable of that. Yeah. Um, And it's so interesting what you ended up studying and what you ended up (laughs) doing, right? And especially without a diagnosis. I mean, that's, it's, yeah, it's, I think. But even with a diagnosis, or even with a diagnosis in terms of, even if you never had ADHD, it's interesting to me that this is what you chose to do. And I wonder if it's because, you know, our best purposes give meaning to our past and yeah. we want to make sure that other kids maybe have an easier time of it. Yeah, it was it was completely accidental because both of my parents were teachers. There's no way I was going to be a teacher. You know, like I've heard this saying that says, if you want your kids to believe what you believe, then have a good relationship with them. And if you want your kids to believe the opposite of what you believe, have a shitty totally. relationship with them. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so it's, you know, I, I was not going to be a teacher. And so when I was getting my degree in psychology, I didn't really know where I was going with that and didn't know that there's nowhere to go with a degree in psychology. But I started working in group homes in my city and some were for children and some were for adults and they were all for people who had cognitive disabilities. And I recognized very quickly that I was really good at helping, whether they were kids or adults, at helping them work through difficult situations. When when things would come up and somebody would be really upset I was really good at helping them work through it. Whereas most of the other staff just didn't know what to do or did things that were really counterproductive, right? Like punishments and, and, you know, just threatening and, and just things like that. I just really recognized I was really good at that. So from there, I decided to, to go into special education And actually didn't even know that special education had branches to it. And so when I started graduate school, there was a grant for people to go into behavior disorders. And I thought, well, that sounds cool. So I got my first master's degree paid for because I went down that route. And during that master's degree, it's funny because I was in the, I was in the second semester of my master's degree and it was February and everybody in my program is talking about applying for teaching jobs, everybody. And I thought, why? That's what everybody's doing. Everybody's going to go teach. I did not know because I am not a detail person 
that one of the conditions of the grant is that you have to teach kids with behavior challenges. Like that was one of the conditions of the grant. And so here it is February and I now (laughs) need to go get a job as a teacher for the next school year. I had no idea that that was the path I was on. Um, And I, I remember I showed up to a job. There was one town that I was working in. I was a case manager at the time and I really liked this town. And so I thought I'm going to go check out their school district. So they were having a job fair, never been to a job fair before. So I showed up having no idea that I was supposed to like bring a resume. So I just showed up and figured out which campuses had these classrooms that I was looking for, for the kids who were having a hard time. And I met with a certain principal at an elementary school and he scheduled an interview with me. I had no experience. I didn't go through a traditional education training program, but I re- I will never forget that he said to me that he hired me because he loved my spirit. Like, I'll never forget that that's what he said. I love your spirit. And so, yeah, that was 2004. And so it all happened in a very unplanned, random kind of way. But once I got in, that was it. I, I, was really good at, at what I do. My kids and I had just the best connection. They made so much progress academically, behaviorally, socially. So that's how I got into doing what I do. So what has changed since you were diagnosed? It's been interesting for me to go through that process because clearly I initiated it because I thought that I had ADHD. But even when the diagnosis came back confirming it, it was interesting that I still went through a little bit of denial. And I still, it's almost like the stages of grief. I still went through feeling not sorry for myself, but mourning the the aspects of me that that were really making life challenging. So even though I'm the one who pursued the diagnosis and I believed that I had it, getting the confirmation shook me in a way I wasn't really expecting. But it also, I immediately, the day I got the diagnosis, I joined your group because I just felt like this was so new to me that I need community. I, I need to be able to, to listen to other, other women that I have shared experiences with. I need to be able to learn some things. I need to be able to share my own, you know, experiences. So it did help me find that sense of community, which I think I don't care whether anybody is formally diagnosed or not. I don't care, but I do think when people are formally diagnosed, it comes with a sense of belonging and a sense of community and a sense of validation that Mm -hmm. there are other people like you and there are other people with your shared experiences. So I do think that having that can be really helpful for people. I think before that point, I even see it in some of my kids that before they get that diagnosis, they feel like they are the only person like them, or they feel like there's something wrong with them. They feel different. They feel outcast. They, you know, just all these more negative associations. But then once it has a name and once you realize that there's a community out there, it has its own sense of inclusiveness. Well, I think it's once we understand why we do what we do and it's not a character flaw, it's not a moral failing, it's just a different brain, then that allows us to stop the shame spiral and the beating ourselves up and really focus on, okay, well, what are the gifts of, frankly, any diagnoses, right? There's always something. So um, I'm wondering... If you told your parents about your ADHD diagnoses. So I am intentionally estranged from my parents. Yeah. Um, It's, 
since before I was diagnosed, just my own choice. Um, and not that there's, I don't have, you know, animosity toward them. I, I personally am a big believer that the people that are in my life, we need to have a mutually beneficial relationship, whoever the people are. Um, and, and I tend to not keep people in my life when the relationship isn't mutually beneficial. Um, and I know for some people that seems really extreme, especially when it comes to the concept of family. Um, but to me, it's my own mental health. It's so that's the choice that I made several years ago. Do you think that maybe your mother had ADHD or has ADHD? You know, I've, I've thought of that. I don't really know. I do from, from my professional experience, I absolutely notice that parents who are autistic or have ADHD really seem to struggle more with their kids who have, who are autistic or have ADHD. Mm-hmm. It's like the, the commonality really brings up a lot of challenges. I think it's really hard for, for them to understand each other. So I've thought about that a lot. If that's why there was so much, you know, conflict is because maybe we are really similar. I do know <laughs> my mother is incredibly creative, just very intelligent, very creative. So I, I don't know. Well, the it, answer sounds, to that. it sounds too like she was often emotionally dysregulated. Yes. Hmm. I, I would say I don't. Which makes parenting hard. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like it was mainly around. You? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't really feel like I noticed it as much about just general day to day stuff. Um, but she, you know, in, in my household, my mother was definitely the alpha parent. Um, and, and so I, I remember things always were the way that she wanted them to be. Um, and if they weren't, that was a problem. Yep. Um, so yeah. Yeah. And you weren't the way she wanted to be. And I suspect it was a lot about kind of exterior impressions. Uh, That's, that's absolutely the way that I see it, that, that, the goal was to have, and, and I even, I wonder now what she says to people when they ask about me. Um, Mm. my dad follows my business on Facebook. Um, my dad and I are actually very similar and Mm. I do mourn the loss of that relationship. Mm. Um, that was kind of a byproduct of the other relationship. Yeah. Um, so my dad follows my business on Facebook. So I know that he knows, you know, kind of what I'm up to vaguely. Yeah. Um, but I kind of forgot what the point was. <laughs> well, we um, were talking about, you know, that the exterior impressions are more important. And I suspect oh, that with you, you're all about and authenticity. I what she said. Yeah. So I, I've always wondered what she says when people ask about me. And I've I've wondered if she tells them. Uh, There's also a big part that is very um, victim mentality. And so I can see that possibly she tells people because then you get to play that role. But possibly she doesn't because she doesn't want to be the parent who doesn't have a relationship with one of her kids. So it's always been curious to me. I wonder, you know what that plays out to be. So they probably know about my diagnosis because I talked about it, you know, through my business, which again, my dad follows me on Facebook. So, you know, um, if I don't know, you know, I've done blog posts about it and, and podcast episodes about it and things like that. I don't know whether they follow any of those things. So yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. I will say that my brother, I'm also, intentionally estranged from my brother. Um, but he had told me a while ago that he was diagnosed with ADHD as an adult. Oh my. I will say that I, I don't see where that's coming from, Hmm. but 
I'm not a professional who diagnoses people. So, yeah. you yeah. know, that's not really my, my call to make. Perhaps it's an attentive ADHD. Perhaps I, I don't see that in him either, but again, it's, I, that's not my role. I'm, I'm not somebody who diagnoses. So I just want to be careful about staying in my lane. Yeah, um, no, I get it. Absolutely. So for three years, Steph, I've tried to get a guest on our podcast to come and talk about the intersection of ADHD and autism. Ah. I have so many women with ADHD who reach out, you know, themselves and contact me literally every single day. I get several requests and they want to be on the podcast, but not one woman with ADHD and autism. Actually, that's not true. I, I'm now thinking that there is someone, and we've been talking about having her on. What I've been looking for, though, is an expert in both ADHD and autism that has both ADHD and autism. And that has been, you know, what the struggle is. And I've, I've asked several women who have both, and nobody's been willing to be a guest. And I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts, Steph, around why that might be? I, I don't. So I, I'm not identified, um, as being autistic. I, I, sometimes I question that to be honest. Um, but I think every time I question it, I feel like ADHD is, is my lane. Um, but I do, it's, it's really interesting to me how well I understand the brains of my autistic students. It's, I can tell what they're thinking. I can tell what they're feeling. If, if somebody, you know, gets upset, I can, I can figure out exactly what happened and where the disconnect is and, and how to help. And it's really interesting to me that, that to most people, autism is an enigma. It's, it's something that a lot of people don't understand. To me, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> Um, it's, yeah, it's really interesting. I actually find ADHD more difficult to understand because to me, autism is pretty black and white. It's pretty easy to figure out for me what my kids are thinking and what, how the pieces fit together. So, you know, a parent will tell me a story about something that happened at school. And even though I'm not there, I can see the whole sequence of events and I can tell them, oh, well, she said that because she, this happened and she thought that it meant this. And it's it's like a puzzle to me and I can just, all the pieces fit together. Um, neurotypical people, not so much. I don't understand them quite as well because I'm a very black and white, straightforward person. Um, and that's a very autistic trait. Um, and it's not a neurotypical trait. And so I sometimes you know, misinterpret neurotypical communication because it's much more, um, it's, it's not so straightforward. And I really appreciate the black and white straightforwardness. Um, so, can, so I go ahead. So can we talk about the intersection between ADHD and autism? Yeah. So we know that some symptoms overlap, right? And yes. then there's also this constant conflict between seemingly contradictory traits. So, so some of the symptoms that overlap and tell me what I'm missing, executive functioning, right? Um, both, mm -hmm. um, if you have autism or ADHD, you will typically struggle with, you know, the ability to plan, manage time, prioritize, working memory, although yes. working memory if it's an area of interest, I think, well, no, I, for, okay, I'm just thinking of myself with my ADHD brain. Even if it's an area that I'm really interested in, I still struggle with working memory often. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Versus with autism, is there that big struggle with working memory if you are focusing um, in on your interests, you know, on those specific topics that you're just, um, so interested in? So working memory is not the same as general memory. Working memory is your ability to take in information in the moment and see how it fits in with other information that you already know and take in information from different sources and be able to put things together mm -hmm. and do something with that information. 
So with autism, typically people who have autistic brains have really good memories for events, for timelines, for information, but that's not the same as working memory. So for example, you can have kids, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for young autistic kids to start reading when they're three years old, but where a lot of people struggle as they get older is doing something with the information that they're getting from what they're reading. So they can read all the words on the page, but then when they get to the end of the page, they may not be able to tell you anything about what they read, or they may not be able to synthesize the information in a way that makes it make sense. So memory, general memory and working memory are are not the same thing. Um, general memory is like facts and dates and information, but working memory is the ability to integrate different things and then do something with that information. And even if you think about from a social aspect, you know, there are a lot of things about social skills that I feel are under the category of misinformation. And one of them that I feel personally is One of the things that tends to be commonly believed is that people who struggle with social skills struggle to pick up on social cues. Mm. I notice that my students pick up on social cues, but they don't know what to do with that information. So they, they notice if somebody's maybe not so interested in what they're talking about, but they don't know what to do next, which is a very different situation than not noticing. That um, is so interesting. I we I call it taking a detour. So we that's one of our lessons in my curriculum is all about teaching kids how to take a detour. So a detour means you're still trying to get to the same place. We just need to get there a different way. And so the classic example I always give is one of my students here um, she's been with me for several years now. When when she was young and newer, I remember she came in for her group one day and she had a little stuffed animal and I opened the door for everybody to come in and she comes running up to me and she says, Steph, look what I have. And whatever she had, a, I don't know, I'll just say a penguin, um, she put it right in my face. And so I typically will have over animated responses, kind of like a cartoon to help make the point. And so I had an overly animated response and I took a step back and my eyes got really big. And I said, it makes me uncomfortable that that's so close to my face. But she was probably seven at the time. And so there was this pause. And then she put it in my face again and said, Steph, look what I have. So she did the same thing all over again. So I don't believe it's that she didn't pick up on the cues. I believe that it's she came in with the thought in her mind of showing me this penguin and with the thought in her mind that I was going to have a very different reaction than what I did. And so when I reacted the way I did, she did not know how to have a different response to that. But you see how those are two very different things. Yeah. And, I absolutely you know, agree. I think even with kids who get stuck on their topic of special interest, part of it is that so many of our kids don't have other topics to talk about. So even if they notice that somebody's not interested anymore, they're out of topics. They're, they don't have a catalog of other things to talk about. And they they don't know how to change the topic. Um, They don't know how to always think about what the other person might want to talk about. So again, I don't believe that it's always that our kids don't pick up on cues. I think it's that they don't know what to do with the information, which goes back to make the point I'm trying to make, goes back to working memory, being able to take things in and compare them to other things you already know and hold them in your mind and then do something with that information. Our kids tend to have amazing, I have students who can tell, like I had a kid that said they were talking about what they like to drink. And I had somebody that said, the last time I had a Coke was in 2016, (laughs) right? And I'm like, 
I couldn't remember that for, for my life, right? I know. I know that they, they, it's just, I, my memory is so poor. And so when they say things like that, it just amazes me that they have this episodic memory and, and this memory for timelines and, and situations. It's just amazing. And some of my kids have really great social memories. They remember the things that people tell them about themselves. Um, and my coworker used to tell me, um, you know, he made the mistake of talking about his girlfriend because then for the next year, <laughs> one of our kids kept asking him about his girlfriend long after she was no longer his girlfriend. Oh, and did, then, he, did he realize that, hey, maybe that person doesn't want to talk about that anymore? But it's that goes back to the even if he would have noticed mm. that you know, the response because I'll ask the kids, hey, what do you notice when you talk about that? And they can say he's kind of looking away from me or he's not answering me. But again, it's it's not the cues, in my opinion, that are the difficulty. It's the detour. It's the knowing what else to do next, right? Or could it also be? They just don't care. They want to talk about that because that's of interest to them. Yeah, I mean, we I can be like that, right? With ADHD, it's like, screw it. I don't care. This is my thing. Yeah, I, I actually, I think in my opinion, that's another piece of misinformation that I have found to not be true about my kids. My, my kids are, and when I say that I currently have about 50 students in my program, um, I've been doing this for seven years. So I've had hundreds of students in my program, plus all the kids I've worked with in the school system, whatever. So it's a pretty big pool of, of kids, you know, just, just the concept that, that autistic people, kids, adults, whatever, aren't really interested in other people, don't really want to be social. I have never found that to be true. Even my kiddos who struggle with language skills um, or struggle with cognitive skills, they're so interested in other people. And they, you know, even I had two kids here last night that their language skills are are not as, as advanced as the rest of the kids, but they will follow the other kids around and pretend play in their own way while the other kids are pretend playing as a group but they'll follow them around and like parallel pretend play. But I've never met a kiddo who doesn't want to be part of the group. There's only been one time that I've had a kiddo come here for the first time and not want to come back. And you know, what's so cool is I actually, we're filming this on a Thursday morning, Monday night. So two and a half days ago, I just got back from being gone for a month. I was on the other side of the world for a month. And, um, my coworker had told the kids where I was. And when I came back on Tuesday, my, some of my older high school kids sat with me for about 45 minutes during game time, instead of playing a game, they were asking me all about my trip. So they were asking me if I would show them pictures, they were making connections to places that they've been. They were making connections to places that they want to go. They were listening to, my, and this is all stuff that we practice, right, in my program. But it just shows that they want to have conversations with people. They want to make connections. They just don't always know how that works. But through this, through my program, so many of my kids have learned and probably six of them were sitting there with me for about 45 minutes. And we were talking about places that they want to go and things they want to see. And um, I went on this trip by myself. And so we were talking about what that's like to go do something by yourself. And it was just the coolest feeling to know that these kids have the ability to have a conversation about somebody else for so long. And they, they didn't start out that way. No, no. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, one of the strategies I try to share with parents is even if your kid doesn't care about age appropriate interests, at least expose them to the information so that they can have conversations with peers. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because even if they don't care about TikTok or Minecraft, or I don't even know the stuff anymore, but even if they don't care, at least expose them to it so that when other kids are talking about it, they can engage in a conversation if they choose to. Because that's what happens to so many of my students is their interests are a few years behind. And so when their peers are talking about things, they have no idea what they're talking about. And so you can't expect them to engage in peer appropriate conversations when they don't have the information to do so. So sometimes I think we expect our kids to be able to do things that they don't have the tools to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to where we started just to get some sort of semblance of some of the symptoms that overlap between ADHD (laughs) and autism. So we started with executive functioning. Yes. Focusing on interests, right? Specific topics that, you know, we really want to focus on. We're super interested in, we're hyper-focusing on them typically. Impulsivity. Would you say that's true? I would say... Obviously, for ADHD, that's really common. I would say for autism, I would not use it to describe general every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I think autistic brains tend to be more calculated and think things through a lot more because they like routine structure, that kind of thing. But I do, uh, impulsivity does come into play when we're talking about things like emotional regulation. Right. So that's where you would you would see a lot more impulsivity is when when we're having a hard time with how we're feeling or when something's bothering us, that kind of thing. Okay. So emotional sensitivity, and that would be for both, right? Yes. Um, what about Which hyperactivity? Sensory. Um, hyperactivity. So and, and I'll tell you my my personal thought about autism and ADHD is I think any characteristic that you're going to come up with, not you personally, but that somebody's going to say is an ADHD characteristic is part of autism, yeah. in my opinion. I agree so, with that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're having a hard time paying attention, it's because you're autistic. That's part of being autistic. Mm-hmm. If you're, you know, I mean, I just think it's it's interesting to me when people get, and again, I'm not autistic, so I, I don't want to, I don't want to come across like speaking for for people that I'm I'm not part of. Um, I want to be really careful about that. But I think when you have ADHD, everything you do and think and say is through your ADHD filter. It can't mm-hmm. be any other way. And the same with autism. Everything you think and do and say is through your autism filter. It can't be any other way. But I think, you know, the characteristics of of ADHD are also characteristics of autism. And so to me, it doesn't really make sense for people to have both because there is so much overlap. Yeah. There, there, yeah. I think, you know, sensory is another one. What what Um, are some other ones that you see are similar? Things that I see are similar. Um, empathy, which again, tends to be a, oh, I forgot how I said that. Just a, a misunderstanding. Um, my kids are so caring and compassionate and empathetic towards each other, towards, me. Um, I, my dog used to come hang out here with us. Um, she passed away last year. And so she was super old before she passed away. They were so empathetic towards her. Uh, they still talk about her and she passed away in June. Do you think that, um, they're more empathetic than neurotypicals? I mean, I would say ADHD people are more empathetic. So I'm curious what your experience is with your hundreds of kids. I think most people who are neurodivergent tend to feel things more strongly. And so I think that goes for all emotions. I think that, and that's part of the challenge with emotional regulation is, is we feel the same things as everyone else, but we feel them more strongly, I believe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I even, I'm a very emotional person, but it goes both ways. I mean, I, I don't, I don't get angry hardly ever. That's not really a thing for me, but I, you know, I can get my feelings hurt. Um, I also cry when I'm really excited. I cry when something I cry here when 
kids say and do really amazing things. I've cried in front of the kids before because somebody will say something and I'm just like, that is so awesome that you just said that. Or, you know, I'll see somebody do something that three weeks ago they they hadn't figured out yet. And I'll cry just out of being so proud of them. So I think that's c- consistent across autism and ADHD is we just feel things more strongly. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So then we've got this conflict, right? When we have both ADHD and ASD, for example, we may thrive on order and routine. That would be the ASD, right? The, the Mm -hmm. autism. But then we also with ADHD, we rebel against, we don't want a routine. Although we need a routine. Like we need a routine yeah. more than anyone. Yeah. I, you know, um, something that I think is interesting, this might not seem like it's related, but in my brain it is. So I really feel like one of the challenges that we have that maybe other people don't have is that I think we feel like a lot of our time is taken up in ways that we did not choose for ourselves. So for our kids, I think it tends to be a lot of therapies and after school activities and things like that. Sometimes I'll have kids that say they don't want to come to Starfish. I've even had kids cry about coming, but once they're here, they are totally fine. And then they're crying that they don't want to go home. But I think it's, I think, and even as adults, I think you know, for me, it takes me so long to do things that other people can knock out in 30 minutes. I'm still working on it four hours later. So I think there's a lot of just kind of internalized frustration over time. And I think that applies to autism and ADHD. I think when we're younger, people are structuring our time for us and we don't always have the opportunity. You know, you may need three hours when you get home from school to decompress but do you get that, right? You may need an hour before bedtime where nobody's talking to you, but do you get that? And, you know, as an adult, you, uh, when I get home from, I'm a hardcore introvert. When I get home from Starfish in the evenings, I need a couple hours. I'm really glad I live by myself because I don't want anybody talking to me. I've My time with the kids is my favorite part of my day but it's mentally exhausting. And so I think we sometimes get frustrated around how our time is spent um, because things take us longer than they take other people, or um, we feel like we have less control over, you know, if, if you work for at a typical job and meetings are popping up, well, maybe you thought you had four hours that morning to work on something or to, you know, process something that happened already. And now there's a meeting on your schedule. You know, I think that's, that's more difficult for autistic and ADHD people because we feel like we need to be able to control our own time better. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. And I think that's when I know I will get dysregulated in those situations because I need that time to calm my nervous system so that Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in control of my day. Yeah. Yeah. I completely relate to that. Do you also find that for your kids that are ASD and autistic, I'm using ASD, ASD and ADHD are do you find that there's some social awkwardness, but then, you know, so they need that alone time, kind of what you were saying to just sort of regroup and depressurize, but they're also really chatty and sociable at the same time. Yeah. I think I, I find that, that a lot of my kids and So I'm going to talk about my kids for a minute, but then it also applies to me. I think it took me a really long time to recognize what I need to regulate myself. I mean, like I'm still working on it. And again, I'm almost 42. I I see that with my kids that um, I'm thinking of one student in particular that she's so social and she's just got, I mean, all of my kids just have the 
coolest personalities. And so she loves talking to the other kids and she's outgoing and she's silly and she's funny and she's intelligent. But when things get like a little too fast paced or when there gets to be too many kids in the conversation, I can see her start to get um, dysregulated, but she doesn't recognize it in herself. And this came up about a year ago. Her mom was, was asking for my help with it because she was in fifth grade at the time and she was in an after school program and she kept getting in trouble. So I was asking her, you know, what, what do you do in this after school program? And basically it's a free for all recess. And immediately, as soon as she said that, I'm like, she's, she's getting overstimulated. She's, Mm -hmm. she's because she's so chatty and social and friendly. She wants to be out there running around and talking to everybody and doing all the things. But then she was like kicking people and um, taking things too far and, and, just getting really dysregulated. And so I talked to her about it and I love so much that my kids trust me so implicitly that when I suggest something to them, they're very receptive to it. And so she's, you know, 11. And I said to her, you know, I, I think this is what's happening. And when I explained it to her, she said, yeah, she said, my brain just can't stop. And then I just get in trouble. And so I said, you know, is there another option besides recess? Is there something else you can do with your time? And she said, well, some of the kids just sit in the cafeteria and do homework. And I I said, is that a choice for you? Are you know, is that something that you want to try? And I don't ever tell my kids what to do. That's a big part of my program is I don't ever tell them what to do. I give them suggestions and I help them understand how different choices play out because they don't know. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. So I just said, you know, I think if you keep going to recess, you're going to keep getting in trouble and you are really frustrated that that's happening. But I wonder if you started going and, and doing homework or even just reading a book she loves to read, if maybe that would help you be more regulated and you wouldn't be getting in trouble so much. And so she agreed to do that. And then she went the rest of the school year without getting in trouble again. But it's, you know, it even as adults, we don't always even recognize what is overstimulating to us or, you know, why we're doing the things that we're doing, why we're all of a sudden yelling at people or why we just want to go home. You know, I mean, even as an I, I have a really hard time waiting in lines. It makes me want to scream at somebody when I have to wait in a line. So I've learned, yeah, I've, I've learned strategies for that, you know, but I again, help. I'm, yeah, I, I will start like humming a song to myself because it distracts me and it puts me in a better mood, you know, but uh, when you're a kid, it's so hard to recognize what's going on in your brain, but that's another, it's just, I, I don't know. I'm just able to see that for my kids a lot, which I really appreciate because then I can help them learn to see it too. Well, what I love about what you do is you teach kids social skills without requiring them to mask, which just seems so harmful because you're basically telling the kid that who they are, you know, they're not allowed to be themselves because there's something wrong with who they are. And so I'm curious, how do you do that? You know, I actually really am not a fan of the term social skills. I just use it because it's what everybody knows. Okay. I When I started my podcast, it was called Social Skills is Canceled. And the whole point is that I don't teach social skills. Um, it's just confusing to people when I say that. So, so when you think of social skills, you're talking about isolated skills. I don't teach my kids isolated skills. I don't ever teach them how to greet somebody, how to apologize, how to um, introduce yourselves. I don't ever teach them things like that because social skills is dynamic. It is so context dependent. I can't teach you how to introduce yourself when that's not even how authentic conversations work. I can't teach you, you know, how to accept a compliment when maybe that person didn't even really mean it. I can't, you know, even things like greeting your peers. Well, 
if we have somebody who comes into the group late and then everybody starts greeting them because they've been taught to greet their peers, but now they're distracted. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's- how do you do this? <laughs> it sounds impossible. So- I I teach social awareness. I teach contextual awareness and I teach my kids how to problem solve. And like I said, my big thing is I teach them the, so consequence is not positive or negative, right? Consequence is just the outcome of something. We tend to think of it as negative, but it's not. I teach my kids the consequences of different choices. So um, let me, oh, I'll give you a great example Last June, I had a new student come into the program and every time before kids start, I meet with them because it's really important to me that I establish a connection with them. Can I ask Um, you before you go any further, Steph, your program, is it all in person? Is that how you run it? It is right now. My intention, I'm not, you know what, let me just put this out there. Starting in June, I am going to start doing Zoom classes so that kids from anywhere can participate in my program. Okay. And And I also license people to start their own. So they get licensed in my curriculum if they want to use my curriculum, but they also, um, I coach them in how to start their own social club. That's their own business. It's not a franchise under me. It's their own. So for example, I have somebody in Ohio that's starting hers in June. And where are you located physically? I am in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Okay. So go on. I'm sorry. Your story. No, no, that's totally fine because that's my grandmaster plan for taking over the world. Okay. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Starting in June, I'm, we're, we're moving to zoom, which I did zoom during lockdown. So I know that it actually works much better than I thought it would, but yeah, I, I definitely want kids everywhere to be able to be part of what we do. But okay, so this student started with me last June. She had just finished fifth grade. So where we are, sixth grade starts middle school. I know it's not always the same everywhere. So she's going into middle school. Um, Fifth grade had been really difficult as far as behavior and social were concerned. Her parents were really concerned about her going to middle school because of all the challenges with her behavior. And so she comes into the interview and immediately starts talking about penises and vaginas. Oh, wow. Um, which to me, I don't react to anything. Is that her special <laughs> just, interest? <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't phase me. But I could tell that she was doing it because her parents were getting really embarrassed. And so I could tell that that was part of the game, right? And so I said to her, hey, you know what? When you come to classes here and there's other kids here, you can talk about anything you want to. And of course her eyes got really big and her parents kind of gave me the side eye, you know, like <laughs> what? Uh, and I said, yeah. I said, do you talk about penises and vaginas at school? Knowing full well that she does. Right. And so, yeah, she says, yes. And I said, do you have friends at school? Do the other kids like you? No, the kids are typically pretty aware of that. Right. And so she said, no. And I said, I wonder, I love, here's a tip for everybody. I love using the concepts of noticing and wondering. Yes. So, yeah. I, I wonder if it's because you talk about things that make them uncomfortable. And then I just left that there. So I said, but here, you know what? You can talk about penises and vaginas if you want to. I said, I just want to tell you what's going to happen if you do. I said, so if you come, you know, tomorrow, whenever she was coming, If you come tomorrow and you talk about penises and vaginas, the other kids are going to go play with somebody else. And you're going to end up with nobody wanting to play with you because here I don't make anybody do anything. So if the other kids choose not to play with you, that's their choice. So had that conversation. She comes on her first day talking about penises and vaginas. And sure enough, the other kids chose to go to a different room. And by the end of the first hour, she had figured that out. (laughs) So So had she, Steph, had she not connected the fact that this is what she talks about with the fact that she had no friends? No, that's the big disconnect is when kids have social learning challenges, that's the disconnect is So I teach about the concept of reputation, which I've never seen another social skills program that talks about that. 
Your reputation is what other people think about you. And it comes from the things that you say and the things that you do. This is the very first lesson in my program. It is free on my website. This first lesson that talks to kids about reputation is free on my website, but it's the foundation of everything. My students either have never heard of the concept of reputation and have no awareness of it, or the next level is that they can tell you about other people's reputations, but have no concept of their reputation. So they think everybody likes them. Um, They think everybody's their friend even though that's definitely not the case. Or the next level is they are very aware that other kids think they are annoying. That's the most common one is annoying, but they have no idea why. So those are the three levels of awareness. It's crazy to me. So so this girl, was she ASD and ADHD or just ASD? Yes. yes. She was both. Um, yes. Hmm. So um, super smart kid. And so after the first week, we were done with penises and vaginas, but then she moved she to stopping. Yes. Because again, every single child that comes here wants to be part of the group. We oh. all have an innate need to yes, belong. We do. Right. This is our tribe, so right? She, she then transitioned to cursing and there were some mm. racial slurs. Oh, <laughs> gosh. I mean, It got a little heavy. And I have to say that I do have to weigh that sometimes as to whether kids can continue in the program if they are being offensive, right? And so my approach is I I can really easily tell if kids want to be here, which is like 98% of the time, I can get that turned around quickly because the social consequences, the natural social consequences will play themselves out and they will figure it out. And I can turn that around. Mm -hmm. The only time I can't turn that around is when kids don't want to be here. Yeah. And so they're doing that to get kicked out, right? Right. Right. It's only, or if there are more significant mental health Mm -hmm. issues going on and they're not able to be logical and rational about it. So that's only happened a handful of times. I have had to dismiss kids, maybe four kids in the seven years that I've been doing this because they were being that I did not feel like they had, they were invested enough to make anything different. I could tell that she was invested because she wanted to be here. She wanted to be around the other kids, but she also had developed this defense mechanism of pushing kids away. It's almost like everybody thinks I'm annoying, so I'm just going to be annoying. Yeah. Right? To get attention. Well, and I see it as I know other kids don't like me, but I don't know why. So I'm going to give them a reason not to like me Mm -hmm. because then I'm in control of it. I get it. Yeah. Right? If kids just don't like me and I don't know why, I have no control over that. So I'm going to put myself in control of it. So that's how I see it. So then we went through several weeks where she was cursing and and racial slurs and that kind of thing. But the same thing happened. The other kids, we also teach all the kids to give each other social feedback. So they would say things like, can you please stop saying that? Or I don't want to play with you when you say things like that. Or I'm going to go, one time she put tape over somebody's mouth just very impulsively. And I looked at the other student and I said, So what do you want to do? Do you still want to play with her or do you want to go play with someone else? And she said, yeah, I'm going to go play with someone else. Right? So there's no artificial consequences here at all. Nobody ever gets in trouble here. There's no such thing. There's also no artificial rewards. There's no treasure box. There's no sticker chart. There is nothing. There is natural social consequences, either the ones that you want or the ones that you don't. That's all that we operate off of here. So within maybe about six weeks, we were through with all of the overtly challenging stuff. And then it was just working with her on, um, she would kind of ask inappropriate questions or say things that she knew would bother other kids. And so then we've been working on that. And now we're in March and she is doing so well. And her mom will send me 
emails talking about things that happen at school. And she told me the other day, it was either the principal or the assistant principal made a comment to her about how amazing this semester is going for her child. Oh, I know. Oh my gosh. I know. And can you imagine if she never got your help? Yeah. This mom has cried over her child. Wow. Because, I mean, the story is quite a grand story. I could see why a lot of people, children and adults, would kind of run from it rather than run yeah, towards yeah. it. Well, and imagine what, you know, what's the typical response to a child saying things like that, especially in fifth grade elementary school, the typical response to somebody talking about penises and vaginas in fifth grade is punishment. Of course. Right? Yeah. Over and over and over punishment, punishment, punishment. But obviously that wasn't working. Right. And then the same child, when she started sixth grade, um, started threatening to kill herself. Oh, but I immediately knew she was doing it so that she could go home. And so we had this conversation. It was happening when she would get in trouble. So then I realized there's a shame spiral going on here. Something has happened. She's gotten in trouble. She's feeling like shit. And now she just wants to go home. So once she and I were able to talk about it, she stopped doing it. But it also requires the adults in her life to be compassionate and understand everybody is doing the best we can. So this child is doing the best she can. Her teachers are doing the best they can. Her parents are doing the best. They, we are all doing the damn best that we can. And so anytime we have a kid who's doing things like this, that means that this is the best she can do given what she has. So our role is to teach her better strategies so that she can do better. Absolutely. So Steph, what is it about you and your ADHD that makes you so good at what you do? I, I think I am a really good problem solver. And I think that's how I see what I do. I, I see it as anytime a child struggling with something that's a problem to be solved. And so I think I have this innate desire and interest in solving problems. And that's what I see. Anytime I see a social situation with a kiddo, I see it as, okay, how can I, how can I help that go better next time? Or how can I help that kiddo learn that thing that they obviously don't know yet? And I can figure out where the disconnect is, and then I can plug that hole um, by teaching a new skill or by helping them become more aware of, you know, what's going on. I also just, I can't really explain why or where this comes from, but I just understand my kids. I, I just, I can hear a story about something and I can tell exactly what they were thinking and why they did what they did. And, and what could be different so that that outcome doesn't happen again next time. I just understand it. So your ADHD intuition. Yeah, I'm incredibly yeah. intuitive. Mm. It sounds like you are always like this, that it just has always come naturally to you. Yeah, my I remember that um, my mother would tell me, because she taught in the elementary school that I went to because we were in such a small town. She would tell me that I always went out of my way to help kids who were having a hard time. And she also brought it to my attention one time that there was a child in my grade the whole time we were in elementary school and that every year they would intentionally put him in my class because he just did really well with me. Um, and he was, he had a lot of behavior challenges. The town I grew up in is, it's a really um, impoverished town. So I, there's a lot of mobility. There's a lot of, you know, kids living in, you know, difficult situations. And so my mom would tell me that they intentionally put him in my class every year so that he could like be with me. So, yeah, I think I've, I've always been intuitive. I've always been really empathetic and I've always been a really good problem solver. And so I think all those things just come together and here I am. It sounds like the ADHD trifecta, right? Problem solver, yeah. intuitive, and empathetic. Yeah, it's yeah. perfect. So Steph, where can people find you if they want to know more about you and what you do? 
Yeah. So my website is starfishsocialclub.org. And so through that website, uh, you can get to my podcast from there. Uh, it's now called oh, Social What's Skills your podcast Unscripted. called? Yeah, it's Social Skills Unscripted. And basically what we do, I used to talk about certain topics and I got so tired of that. So now my coworker and I just randomly jump on whenever we feel like it during the week. And we talk about things that have happened with our students that week. So we, we share strategies and stories and successes. But the goal is that parents and teachers can hear stories of kids like theirs and then hear the strategies that we use with the kids so that they can start to use them as well. So yeah, that's my podcast. It's actually just celebrating its one year anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah, thank Wonderful. you. And I am absolutely inconsistent with it, completely inconsistent, but I focus on being persistent. <laughs> Okay, so we'll have all of that in the show notes. Steph, thank you so much for spending time with us here today. This was fascinating. Oh, I'm so glad. And yeah, if anybody wants to start their own club like mine, I can teach you how to do that too. So you can find that on my website as well, because I would love to have versions of you know my program all over the place. It's just, I have to say, it's the coolest thing. Well, clearly you are hyper-focusing on that interest. (laughs) And what I also want to say is if there is anybody listening to this podcast who is an expert in autism and ADHD and has both autism and ADHD, or you know of such a brilliant human, I've been looking for you and I sure would like to talk to you. So please reach out to me at support at tracyotsuka.com. Thank you again, Steph. Thank you. So that's what I have for you for this week. If you like this episode with Steph, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smartass Women. Come join me over at tracyotsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smartass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smartass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smartass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyotsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is A-OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.